uh, take some time to answer some at the end. And then the other uh, person that you see is Matt Sprick, who is our um, Chief Operating Officer at Encore Publishing and Safe and Civil Schools. For those of you who don't know, he's my boss. And so um, uh, it's a, he's, a great, he's a great boss and I really am appreciative to all these folks who are supporting me. As you can imagine, um, I feel like you do. You had to turn your instruction on a dime. Um, Matt Sprick and I were actually in Los Angeles the week that schools closed. And I remember I was at Mochler Elementary in the Paramount Unified School District. And what I watched was absolutely incredible. Um, the superintendent made the announcement that we were gonna close schools. And just like that, teachers immediately went into action. And I was so impressed with them as I am with all of you because all over the country, you've been able to meet the needs of youngsters. So um, I'm just going to admit I'm uh, still getting used to Zoom, probably like you were, uh, but I'm delighted that you're here with me. I'm delighted that uh, you chose to hang out with us just a little bit this afternoon. So I'm going to go ahead and um, share my screen. I know you're familiar with that language. And let's talk about uh, what our outcomes are for the uh, webinar. So I've got two things that I think are gonna be really important for us to think about. Um, the first is everything I've read um, says that we really need to pay attention to students' basic needs. And fortunately, if you're really familiar with our foundations material, you know that in module C of that material, we have a really great way for you to analyze the degree to which students' needs are being met at your school by your current programs and practices. And so I do wanna introduce that to you just a little bit. And then um, I'd love to tell you that I have all the answers for how school's gonna open. Uh, just like you, I've read everything from the CDC recommendations. I'm right now at my home in Kentucky. I've read what Kentucky says. I've read what Texas says. I've read what California says. And to be honest with you, we're going to have to rely on the departments of public health we're gonna to have to rely on our local state and maybe federal guidelines. We will have to look at what our local superintendents and our local school boards deem is gonna be best for us. And it may be different. So when you have questions that are very specific about, you know, how am I gonna teach PE in a classroom of 10 students? I, I, I don't know, uh, but here's what I do know. I know that Safe and Civil Schools has has always used the stoic framework to help us make decisions. And as much as some of the decisions are going to be made by those entities that I just mentioned, they're not gonna be able to drill down and make the unique ones that are gonna be necessary for your particular building. And so that's what I wanna do today is just look at the stoic framework and how it might be very helpful as you move forward doing that. So that uh, if we can get through those outcomes, I will feel very good about this. As I was preparing for this, um, um, I did a little bit of research and I found a very interesting article from National Public, Public Radio. And they had actually done some investigation about where we had had school closures based on uh, humanitarian crises. Uh, they looked at what happened in Louisiana after Hurricane Katrina they looked at what happened um, after a genocide in Rwanda and what happened in West Africa after a large Ebola out, uh, out, outbreak of Ebola, very similar to what we're doing today. And they concluded that school closure had a deep and lasting impact on kids. It not only affected their long-term academics, but their mental health. And that was even before we were looking at mental health um, as we are nationwide in schools across the country. So we do know that schools can, uh, the, the way we structure our schools can certainly help uh, provide uh, schools with, I'm sorry, provide students some tools that they need, they need to cope. So we should all expect that there's gonna be a social and emotional impact on all students, but I really want you to start thinking about those kids that you've been worried about. Those have been the ones that perhaps you couldn't reach their parents. They didn't answer the door. They weren't turning in work. They weren't showing up on Zoom. Those are the ones that we really need to keep in mind, but we really need to keep everybody in mind. And then this article said 
that our first and foremost um, consideration was to make sure that kids re-entered into a safe, nurturing and supported environment. But the other big piece that I kept going to was they said, in, in the midst of all that, we need to continue to provide sound academic instruction. And um, so I think we have to be really careful. That's gonna be a, an interesting, interesting balancing act. Um, what, oops, wrong way. I knew that was gonna happen. All right, so, um, so we know that the well-being of youngsters is gonna be our number one priority. And that article said that this is really an essential condition to, uh, to student achievement. But we need to remember that all students, even those kids that come from a really safe, supportive, nurturing environment in their homes, they've experienced some um, instability. Uh, perhaps parents have talked about job insecurity or the fear of a job loss, or maybe we've talked about where are we gonna pay the bills, or we've talked about, um, you know, that we don't have enough food. Um, those kind of things uh, can, can really impact um, our youngsters. We also may have put kids in a position where while parents were working at home, they had to uh, be caregivers for younger children and they'd never done that before. And then another big consideration that I think we have is that kids have missed social interaction. I was, um, I've been working with a lot of schools digitally as you've been working with kids. And I was talking to Kim Earthman, who's a good friend of mine and she heads up our uh, foundations in all of our safe and civil work in Conroe ISD. And she was telling me about her fifth grade daughter. And I guess during the uh, time that they had off, they had opportunity to go up and clean her fifth grade daughter's bedroom. And Kim admitted that it probably hadn't been done in a while because she's a busy woman, trust me. And um, she said her daughter got in the closet where they were cleaning it out and she found a bag that she brought home from her Christmas party. And in that bag, there, was some, there were some cards and uh, some glasses made out of pipe cleaners. And she said her daughter broke into hysterical um, sobs. And what that represented was she was really missing the social interaction that she had with her peers. She was missing her teacher. She was missing you. She was missing her friends. And so I don't think we can discount the impact uh, that that's had. So we want schools to recognize this and make sure that we are ready to welcome kids every uh, single day. Um, I want to look at that first um, idea now, and that is how can we um, assess and meet our students' basic needs? So if you're familiar with this, if you used our old administrator's desk reference, or if you have foundations, you know that we really look at if, student, if schools are meeting eight basic needs of youngsters, and these are um, not necessarily Maslow, but they're... Um, sort of a collection from a variety of needs theorists. And we feel like these are the ones that we can most affect at school. So I wanna quickly go through these um, and then we'll um, ask a question, give you some time to ask a question because I'd love to hear if there are programs or practices that you're doing that allow, that, that really allow schools to meet these uh, needs. So let's just look at these in order. The first one is it's just simple old acknowledgement. That's just positive, non-contingent attention. So kids don't need to do anything in order to get that attention from us. Um, and it's just a way that we demonstrate to students that they're highly valued. And I think once we all get back under one roof, it's, we're really gonna wanna show kids how we value them. There are simple ways we do this. Now that first one, I think we might have to take a pause on because honestly, if, if what I read in the CDC is everybody's gonna be masked up, uh, we're going to have to practice smiling with our eyes and we're going to have to practice with our masks on, making sure that kids can catch that smile. Um, a simple nod, using kids' names, uh, just remembering what they're interested in, their hobbies outside of school. Certainly if they're, they've been absent, making sure we have a greeting for them. So just the simple, just basic human uh, decency in terms of making sure that every single youngster um, is acknowledged every day. The second one, I think we're really good at. Now this is contingent because we're gonna recognize something that, that kids have done, either an academic accomplishment or a behavioral one. And so we do this really well in schools. We praise students, we send positive notes or we put positive notes on their papers. 
Um, we give a lot of certificates. Uh, we have rewards and celebrations. I know a lot of us have missed that this spring. We didn't get to have those. For some of your youngsters, grades fulfill recognition, not all. Um, I know we've really emphasized those positive phone calls to families, but those are all ways that we recognize youngsters. So I'm gonna guess you're pretty solid at that one. This is um, the third one. This is attention and it's really important. And this is really more important than a lot of people understand because when we talk about a child's need for attention, we're not just talking about positive attention when we're acknowledging you or we're recognizing you, but we also have to understand that um, it's the attention that we pay to misbehavior. So there are a couple of things we have to keep in mind about this. First of all is, is I think this is gonna be critical. Different kids are gonna need different levels of attention. Um, I think if you've ever been in a training with me, you've heard me say that I was my uh, parents' youngest child. And I, of the three of us, have the least level of need for attention. So you can imagine uh, the high level of attention that both my brother and sister uh, uh, needed. Um, so here's what we know, that if I, if I have a high level of need for attention and I'm not getting it because you're noticing uh, the things that I'm doing well and or you're just engaging in non-contingent attention with me, chances are I'm gonna act up in order to get your attention. And so we have to consider all of that attention. And then there's another concept that we don't talk about very much, and I'll explain it through an anecdote, but the magnitude of attention a student gets doesn't necessarily affect the frequency. Let me just give you a quick example. Years ago, when I was teaching at Paul Lawrence Dunbar High School, I had a student named April, and um, she was always in my face, needed attention. And so I thought, okay, I'm gonna do something to satiate her need. So we had a little contract and I was gonna eat lunch with her and she was gonna polish my fingernails and I thought that's gonna do it. And so she, she and I had lunch, just the two of us. And I think she braided my hair and polished my fingernails. And 10 minutes after lunch was over, she was back in my face needing attention. And so what I learned was I could never satiate that. What I needed to do for April was give her a little bit of attention frequently. So you might wanna think about who's gonna need that frequent level of attention. And believe it or not, some of our youngsters have been used to having a ton of attention from their parents. And so we have to be really careful that we're prepared to, uh, to provide that. I think belonging is one of those things that we really need to think about. And that's the sense that students have of being a part of something bigger than themselves. Uh, and for most kids, that's a major, school is the major way they get that. So I think we have to think about ways that we can do that. As I mentioned, I've been working with some schools this week. And one of the teams from, uh, that I was on the phone with, with or with, on Zoom with, with in Conroe this week, they're already preparing to have t-shirts made uh, that, that correspond with the learning community that that youngster is assigned to. So they're already thinking about ways of belonging. Now t-shirts, very expensive. You may not have PTA or funds that can do that, but you know, something as simple as, um, years ago I was working with Kalispell Junior High School in Kalispell, Montana. And when those kids came back to school that year, every single child's name was on a little, like a five by seven piece of paper with the school's um, mascot on it that just said, welcome back, Susan Isaacs, and the little Lancer that was their uh, school mascot. So something as simple as just having every single kid's name visible in your foyer might be a way to look at that sense of belonging. Um, the other is purpose. We know that the, that sense of intention or meaning gives direction and coherence to students' actions. And so we want every kid to understand that there's a purpose to working hard and behaving well. Um, so thinking about how we um, de de uh, devise lessons that um, show purpose and then making sure that we're providing rationale for why we're asking or why we're teaching some of our behavioral expectations may appeal to that sense of purpose. The next one is competency or sometimes it's referred to as mastery. And that's just a sense that kids have of doing something well and we all have this. And now this has a lot to do with motivation. And so we really wanna make sure that we can help all students succeed academically, but we also wanna make sure that we've given them the tools that they can 
um, demonstrate the same behavior that we want them to exhibit. So I think it's not just about academics, but also, also behavioral competence. Uh, nurturing is gonna, this is gonna be a hallmark of what we need when we go back and that's that, assist, that sense of assurance that, that kids are loved unconditionally. I don't know um, that we've ever been challenged that we love kids unconditionally. I know some teachers in our, in our country certainly have, uh, but I do think we can think about this unconditional positive regard. So if you're taking notes, we're not gonna ask you to love kids unconditionally. I don't know that I can mandate that, but I believe that we can almost ask every single uh, person in the school to have unconditional positive regard for the youngsters uh, that, they're, that, they, that they're in charge of. The last one is just stimulation and change. And so that means that kids need a lot of variety. Um, many of us have experienced, as I have trying to do Zoom, and get some variety in my Zoom classes. It's very difficult. I'll be glad when we're back person to person. I think it's easier to have a um, lot, more, lot more engaging activities. Uh, but we also know that sometimes our positive programs and practices are have gotten a little stale. So you know, sometimes it's like, oh, okay, who am I going to cho choose for student of the week? So you may want to think about, do, do some of those need to be changed? And is this a good time as we go back to school after an interruption in order, in order to do that? So we want to think about, um, first of all, our effective uh, practices, uh, but also then our, our uh, positive reward prog uh, programs. So let me just pose a question to you and just take a few minutes and I'm going to open the chat box. So if you'll put this, these answers in the chat box, what positive programs are in place to meet those basic needs of youngsters. And if you'll just take a couple, I'm just gonna open the chat box and read a couple of these. So if you just take a, just if anybody can throw up an answer, that would be awesome. Oh, morning meetings, that's gonna be a great one. Oh, the PACS Good Behavior Gammy. I was just reading about that. Positive postcards. Lots of class meetings, caught being good card, assemblies. That might be a great way to get uh, school started again as well. Principals 200s Club. I don't know if you saw Bill's webinar yesterday, but these are all, um, all excellent, excellent ideas. Thank you very much for taking the time to answer those. Um, when this is over, I'd like to read some more. It's going to just help grow my um, uh, repertoire of, of examples. I'd like to move now to the next um, outcome that we had, and that is how do we begin to use this stoic framework in order to help us make decisions. And so if you're not familiar with the stoic framework, we really believe that all PBIS, uh, all, all of PBIS, really all the components of PBIS could be uh, placed under one of these variables. And so um, quickly I'll go through them and then we're gonna look at them in detail in the remaining time. So the first is how do we structure all areas of our school and classrooms? I'm gonna talk about both of those in order to ensure students can be successful. And once we've developed those structures, then we have to teach those expectations, routines, procedures, we have to teach those to mastery. Observe really looks at two uh, components. One is um, just plain old supervision. Um, are, we, are, are we really doing our best to uh, observe youngsters? Are we keeping an eye on them? But also the O in the stoic framework looks at how we're using data uh, to make decisions. The fourth variable is just to build those positive interactions, to build those positive relationships. And, um, I frequently say if you had a if you, if you could draw a bracket around those first four, I call those the prevention variables. And that's really where we want to spend a great deal of our time as we're thinking about uh, structuring our school is structure, teach, observe, interact positively. And then the last one is we're going to have to correct fluently. And um, so we want to talk about uh, each of these um, in just a little bit uh, a little bit more detail. So, Let's start with structure. Um, as I was reading the CDC's uh, recommendations this morning, probably as you did, I 
what am I going to do? Uh, but you're going to have to make some decisions. And some of those decisions, I'm going to guess, will be made for you, but not all. So if we're going to continue social distancing, we've got to make some decisions. For instance, will food be delivered to classrooms as opposed to eating in the cafeteria? Um, I saw on the news this morning, like you did, that some schools in Europe have been putting up those plastic barriers across cafeteria tables. I don't know how we're going to do that, but that's, a, that's also a, a potential. Um, hallway transitions. In elementary school, that may mean that our specialists are visiting uh, classrooms and I'm going to try to teach PE in a classroom or I'm going to try to teach music in a classroom rather than my own environment. As we look at high schools and middle schools where we have literally hundreds of kids in the hallway changing classes, that's probably going to mean that you're going to have to make some decisions about staggering class change. You, we're probably going to have to take um, uh, a page out of the playbook of our big box stores that we've all been to, and we're going to have to put marks on the floor. Uh, and I don't even know what we're going to do with four, four and five year olds. Uh, I don't know how we're going to social, socially distance them. I was glad to hear this morning that the CDC, although I've been watching and they've, they've been shifting some of their information that maybe the virus isn't as um, uh, easy to catch off surfaces. If that's true, then we might be able to go back and use that little rope that we taught our kindergarten or our preschool kids to to walk in a line that might be useful. I don't know, we'll have to, maybe we'll know more uh, about that. Um, in elementary schools, we may have to look at uh, arranging our playground and have students go in the areas of that playground on a rotating basis. And so maybe my, the second grade goes to the play structure on Monday and they get the soccer field on Tuesday and we really spread that out and rotate uh, that. I'm going to guess that arrival and dismissal will be somewhat dictated by our school districts as, as we begin to stagger our arrival times if we have to do that. We also need to think about our big, um, our big areas, um, our gym, our media, our, our media center, library. How are we going to use those um, and could they be used in other ways? And so I think there's always some um, issues for us to, to be able to look at. And then our youngest students. Um, I do think that we're going to have to, especially our students who've never been in school before, um, we may have to look at um, having additional adults in those spaces, um, especially at the first. So uh, anybody who's an extra pair of hands, our school social worker, our school psychologist, our special education teacher, if they aren't yet with youngsters. So we've got to, it's got to be all hands on deck. So we may have to be, everybody be flexible enough that we're going to change some job descriptions at least a little bit. Um, the other questions that occurred to me were, what about safety and, and uh, security measures? I know many of your schools that I visit on a regular basis, we are using the Raptor system so that when I come in, I give you my ID and you run it through that system. Um, but what if we're wearing face masks? So that's gonna be another consideration. And then it's very likely that parents who love to come to lunch, particularly at elementary schools, uh, are gonna, we're gonna have to have restrictions on the number of visitors that can come in. So that might affect at our high schools, um, guest speakers, uh, guest uh, teachers, Etc. So we want to uh, want to look at that. So hopefully you're working from some kind of a PBIS team. Now, of course, from Safe and Civil Schools, we would call that the foundations team. That's what it says on my slide. But if you don't have either one of those, then it could be a leadership team. And the reason I, I'm really focused on this team is I, I don't want to put our administrators in such a position that they're having to make all of these decisions together. And I know that the foundations teams that I'm privileged to work with, many of those teams are so skilled in thinking through all the new nuances of what we just talked about, that they're going to be of great help uh, to the administration in each of your buildings. So um, we hope that the team will have looked at all of the common areas. So your cafeteria expectations, your hallway, arrival, dismissal, even your restroom procedures, which is, you know, we didn't even talk about cleaning, but that's a whole other area. But then also our common policy um, procedures like 
tardy, electronics, et cetera. We want to look at those and just think about what, what was working already and we just simply need to reteach it. Um, are there some that was working okay, but really needs minor modifications? And then are there some that we haven't even gotten to? We, we, we were in a process of doing this and we aren't there yet. And so we really need to target that one before school starts. And then looking at how, what format, we'll talk about teaching in a minute, but what format and what's gonna be our schedule? I'm gonna talk more a little bit about that when we get to the next one. But here's what, um, this is gonna be a recommendation that I make just based on years of experience of doing this. And that is that every single staff member has got to know what are the procedures and they've got to have them stone cold. There's not going to be much wiggle room, uh, much room for error. And so the entire staff should really have access to written documents of all of those common area expectations and common policies so that all the staff will have access and be able to implement that. When we think about the, uh, the structure of the classroom, um, this, when I sat down to put this together, the first thing that occurred to me was, um, and it's not even on my slide, is that in some elementary schools, we don't even have furniture to socially uh, distance. Since around 1990, um, it's been almost the rule that classrooms in elementary schools are, um, kids are sitting in group tables. And so we may have to dig around in some old warehouse somewhere and dig out some chair desks in order to even start this process. But I think that we have to really understand that a lot of our schools, by the time we get back, they will have been out of school almost six months. And so even relatively simple classroom routines are gonna to need to be re-examined. So um, things as simple as, as I was putting this together, some, I was talking to somebody and they said, oh my gosh, that my kid, He's, gonna, he's not going to know not to interrupt anymore. Um, and, I do, and, and I know that mother was providing a great homeschool environment, but every homeschool environment, none of them mirrored your classrooms. And so students have probably forgotten things like how to line up, how to take turns, how to not interrupt you, um, how to share materials and equipment if they're even able to do that. And then the big one that I think we need to think about is sustaining attention. And we're probably gonna to have to gradually get kids back to where they can sustain attention to a task for very long. So my suggestion, and I know this sounds very simplistic, but I think it would be helpful is every single teacher should sit down and think through, if you're an elementary teacher, your whole day. If you're a middle school or a high school teacher, period by period, what are the basic routines that I've used in the past? And I need to think about how I'm gonna teach those, how I'm gonna practice those, and how I'm gonna put that on repeat. Because it's gonna be important that all of us are patient as kids get used to being back in school. I can't stress that enough. Um, as we're thinking about teaching our school-wide expectations, one of the things that we know is that Typically we do this the first couple of weeks of school and after that we think, okay, they got it. And then we do it more or less quarterly or when our data indicate that it's time for us to reteach. The new reality is gonna mean that we're gonna have to teach these really well into the school year because even our kids that we think should have this, like our third graders and up, they're gonna need additional time. And I do think we need to be very, very careful um, that we can't say things like you should know this by now, or um, I can't believe you don't have this, or how many times do I have to tell you this? Those are things we probably ought to eliminate from our vocabulary, at least in the, in the short run. And we wanna just remember that safe supported environment as we're teaching, that's gonna be critical to this. As we think about teaching our expectations in the classroom, um, if you are familiar with at all with our classroom management process called CHAMPS, and CHAMPS is really um, an acronym. Uh, it's, it's really chapter four of that. Of that it's a text, but it's also an acronym, but it helps teachers think through and make decisions about how they want student behavior during various activity structures and transitions. And I, I think it's important that if I can sit down just with a piece of paper or my champs book, if you have one and say, okay, 
during this activity, what should conversations sound like? Who can they talk to? How long can they talk? How loud, et cetera? Um, how are they gonna get help during this activity? What, what's the, what's the, what's the um, what is the function of the activity? Is it teacher directed? Is it a group work? Is it a think peer share? What's that activity? Uh, what movement can be allowed? And then what will participation look and sound like and maybe even not look and sound like? And then if we all do it, we'll be successful. So the S is there. So I may wanna think about all of my classroom activities and transitions and really apply that CHAMPS acronym to help me make decisions about what that looks like. Um, some teachers, I, I think, feel, okay, my kids don't really need a visual prompt. I'm gonna suggest that a strong visual prompt, really, I, I'm not necessarily, I don't mean a CHAMPS poster, but some sort of visual prompt, whether it's a part of your PowerPoint presentation, it's a part of your, uh, uh, it, there, is a, there is some sort of a, uh, a poster, uh, maybe you have it on a flip chart, but even if you didn't use one in the past, I'm gonna suggest that as we start this year, um, that's gonna be a nice visual anchor chart for those, for those youngsters um, to really understand what you expect from them. And then we want you to, to think about practicing those common routines, especially the ones that you use daily, very early in the year. You may have to practice them way more than you ever have. But I'd also suggest that you hold off on those routines that you use less commonly. Just do those as they come up. I think we're going to have so much to teach at the beginning. So, for instance, if I don't give it, if I'm not giving a test until the third week of school, I'm not going to teach test taking that first week. So, just use some, you know, just be logical about how you're doing that. We are going to have to to come up with a routine and a procedure for social distancing in the classroom. And you may need to even think about installing some physical uh, cues either on your floor. Um, I hope that we don't have to go to, as I saw the, the picture in Japan of the children with the hats and the pool noodles on, I hope we don't have to do that. Um, I don't wanna wear a hat with a pool noodle. So, and then the other just good rule of thumb is anytime I'm using a, a new or an unfamiliar to my class activity, the structure of the activity really should be more important than the outcome. So if I'm having kids do a group um, project or they're gonna to work together in the group, the first couple of times I do it, really it's teaching the process of group work rather than the group, than the outcome of that. So, and then uh, the one big thing is we are gonna to have to give way more feedback. We're gonna talk about more of this in, more in a little bit, but we're gonna to have to give way more feedback to the teaching learning process than perhaps we've ever done. And so we wanna think about teaching all of our classroom expectations and routines to mastery. So um, that's there. Um, it was very interesting when I, when I started putting this together, um, I, I called a lot of people, um, Trish Skiles, you might've seen her, um, webinar. Uh, my colleague Jane Harris went through this with it, Randy Sprick. Um, and as I was talking to Trish, um, one of the things that she's, we were talking about, she said, I think we need to make sure that our supervisors, as we're talking about observation, are ready with their game faces. And I said, Trish, tell me, tell me what you mean. And she, um, I'm gonna I, I, she's a great friend and my colleague for many years. Um, but I'm going to give you a little bit of information. She's probably shared it with you, but she has still a reluctance of flying. And she, like me, before this all happened, we were probably on an airplane every week. And she, um, she's, not, she's not a fearful flyer, but she's a reluctant flyer. And she said that anytime she, anything unusual happens on an airplane, let's say there's some turbulence or perhaps an unusual noise, the first thing she does is look to the flight attendants. And if they're calm and they're collected and they look cool, then she's able to reduce uh, that little anxiety. And of course, if they don't do that, then I'm sure her anxiety is heightened. But, I've, but when, she, when she said that, it made perfect sense to me that, you know what? Something unexpected is gonna happen. Kids are gonna get too close to each other. Kids are going to cough on somebody without putting their mouth in their elbow somebody's going to touch their mask and touch their eyes. And we have to be very careful that we stay calm so that we don't make something worse. So uh, we may need to practice putting on our game faces just a little bit. 
um, before we get back together. Um, the other thing that Dr. Sprick advised is we have to be very careful to watch because this might be cyclic. Kids may come in and be very, appear very well adjusted and we think everything's going well and all of a sudden two, three weeks later, we've got an uptick in anxiety with our youngsters. And so we really need to think about that and, wa and watch for it. I also realized that we've been distant from each other for um, six months. And um, we're probably going to be very hungry for adult interactions. And so if I was doing this pre-pandemic, I would certainly stress, hey, remember when you're a supervisor, you need to make sure that nobody else distracts you. And I'm not backing off from that. I'm just saying we've got to give a little bit of wiggle room or a little bit of grace. Um, and maybe we want to think about using teams of supervisors. So I don't feel so alone when I'm out on the playground or I'm in the cafeteria or at arrival or at dismissal. I know that we may not have the luxury of that much staff, but I, where we can if we can, if we can have teams of supervisors, I think it's going to be a, a whole lot easier. Um, the majority of the interactions during our supervision really should be positive. I think sometimes supervisors think the only time I need to interact with youngsters is when I see misbehavior. And I want us to flip that and think, you know what, my first goal is to build those relationships with youngsters. And so we want to make sure that we're engaging a lot with those youngsters who are behaving responsibly. And of course, I would be remiss if I didn't have on here the three hallmarks of good supervision. One is making sure that you're circulating in unpredictable patterns uh, throughout the, your assigned area, that I'm visually scanning the area, and that I'm using that power of, of what I hear looking for a change in the noise level, either too loud or too or no noise, uh, that tells me I might need to pay a little, a little bit closer uh, attention. As we think about observe in terms of using data to make decisions, um, I'm going to suggest that at the beginning of the school year, we are very, very careful with the collection of hard data. Um, I, I, I don't see that anybody needs to be in anybody's class taking ratios of positive interaction or looking at opportunities to respond when the school year starts. I think observational data, which we are all very good at, is going to be able to give a lot of insight into where our kids are struggling, maybe where some of our adults are struggling. Um, you know, it, it occurred to me that um, I've actually experienced not what we, what we have, but I worked, at, many of you don't know this, but I worked at an alternative school for youngsters with severe emotional and behavioral disabilities for nine years. In that building, we had approximately 100 kids grades six through 12 with emotional and behavioral disabilities. And I can promise you that as much as we were doing a real solid job, there were lots of times that unexpected behavior came up and we weren't really sure if we'd applied the right strategy to address that behavior. And as I was thinking about how we might use observation, I was reminded of my brilliant principal, Bob McLaughlin, who simply said, you know what, ladies and gentlemen, every, every, every other day we're gonna hold an informal meeting and we're gonna meet up in the media room and we're gonna talk about of those, any of those unexpected events that happen and let's all brainstorm together. Was it the right thing to do? Was there a better way to handle it? And so as I was, I was putting this together, I thought, you know, that may be, we might wanna use the Bob McLaughlin School of, of, um, of, of data collection and just bring people together informally. Um, grade levels could even do this on their own. PLCs could do this on their own, but certainly the first couple of weeks of school, administrators, you may wanna just offer an end of day debrief or even an end of week debrief just to bring people together and let's talk about, do we see kids struggling somewhere? Do we need to provide some help? And then, uh, Trish Skiles reminded me too that one data point could be that the absence of an event could be positive data. So if we've made it through the cafeteria four days with no incident or we've done fine on the playground, we need to, we need to just chalk that up as a win. And so I think our data may be different. Now, uh, one of the things that you might want to do though is after a few weeks, it probably is time to do a quick check of ratio of positive interactions or some of those hard data that we, that we like to look at. But certainly the first couple of weeks, we're going to be very gentle as we, as we make decisions. 
The I in um, stoic, which is probably one of the most critical ones, is going to be our tool for reestablishing those positive relationships. And many of you haven't lost them. I keep watching um, on television and on the internet teachers driving by and dropping bags on kids' porches and having conversations in driveways. And so I know some of you haven't even lost those, re, uh, those relationships. So um, for some of you, it won't be a reestablishment. It'll just be a continued establishment. But again, it's one of the most essential components. And so we want to make sure that everybody is prepared to do this. And one of the best ways that I think we can do this is to think about being intentional. How can we intentionally make sure that these things happen? Uh, if you've ever been in a training with me, you've heard me talk about um, the school that I, I'm so privileged to work with, and that is Betty Best Elementary in um, the A Leaf School District in, Conro in I'm sorry, in A Leaf, Texas. Um, and that little school, one of the most unique places, a very, very successful school in a very challenging area. And several years ago, when I went to observe there, I was so impressed because when I walked in the front door, there were already about seven adults spaced, even without social distancing, about 10 feet apart. And they had only one job. And that one job was to greet every single student who walked in the door every morning. So as much as some of us do that almost innately, I think we ought to be way more uh, prescriptive with that. So let's come up with a plan. How are we going to ensure that every student is greeted every single morning? So, and, and, and if we're wearing masks, are we going to have to do a little silent wave, a little like a, this hug? So we may have to build in some of those things. I mentioned earlier that as we're looking at teaching our expectations, the best way to teach either new behavior or to reteach behavior is through positive feedback. Um, my colleague, Dr. Anita Archer says, feedback is the essential ingredient in instruction. So before we get back to school, I do think that we need to do a quick refresher on how to frame and deliver positive feedback because it can't just be good job, good job, good job, good job. It can't be, I like the way, I like the way, I like the way, I like the way. We've gotta be really intentional about our positive feedback. So um, in our materials, certainly in Champs, in Foundations, in any of our materials, you're gonna find information about the power of positive feedback. We need to make sure it's accurate. Don't lie to children. We need to make sure that it is specific and descriptive. I need to just notice and narrate what I saw. It's very simple to do. I wanna make sure it's, I'm not insulting kids, that it's not, that it's age appropriate. We wanna make sure that we give that feedback as close as we can to either the academic or the behavioral uh, performance of that youngster. And then certainly just make sure that it's authentic. Make sure that it's given in a way that reflects your personal style because kids will know if you're being authentic um, or not. And of course, um, you if you've ever worked with me before, you know I could not leave this discussion without talking about the most essential but most difficult strategy in behavior management, and that is the concept of ratio of positive interactions. And really what that means is that we are, at, it's, it's, I know a lot of people think it's, um, it's, it's about positive feedback, it's really about attention. And so this really asks, what, what are you paying the most attention to? And so we wanna make sure that we are paying attention at least three times more to kids when they are behaving responsibly than the one time we have to correct them. So you might have to look for opportunities to do that. I'm also gonna go on to the next one because there's a little interaction between the, inter the racial positive interactions and correct. So let me go on to my uh, last of the stoic framework and mm -hmm. let's uh, walk this um, between these two. First of all, I'm, I'm, I moved over to this one because I believe we're going to be correcting a lot of misbehavior. Um, I think we have to understand that some of our youngsters have had very few limits placed on them during the crisis. Um, many of them have been alone for long periods of time. So that means if we're gonna have to correct a lot, it means my ratio of interaction is gonna become skewed. And so you're gonna have to be aware of those numerous corrections and start then looking for opportunities to provide that ratio of positive interaction. Um, as I was putting, again, putting this together, I went back and watched Dr. Sprick as he did the webinars for uh, families and caregivers and parents who were 
trying to work, uh, teach their children at home. And I watched what he said. And so really this is just a mirror. Uh, nobody says it more eloquently than he does. And he um, encouraged us to be gentle with our corrections, at least at first. And he said that all of us, when we, um, when we get back, need to be prepared to respond to either early stage or preliminary or and mild misbehavior with just easy, and he used this word, common sense procedures. And so we need to be careful about using any kind of big system. Let's just, let's just use common sense. So the first common sense for most of us is, I look around, find somebody who's doing the right thing, and I go, wow, Jane, you're doing an excellent job. And that may get um, Nick to, do, uh, to change what he's doing. That, usually works. If that doesn't work, or if I just need to do this because it makes more sense, I just gently correct youngsters. Hey, remember at Glendover Elementary, we don't behave that way. Hey, remember here at Southern Middle School, that's not the way we handle things. Hey, remember at Dunbar, we don't talk like that. So it's just gonna be that gentle correction. If that doesn't work, another suggestion would be that you um, discuss at a, at a um, calm, neutral time um, uh, and explain why the behavior is problematic and then help the youngster explore some other ways to get their needs met. Um, Dr. Sprick summed this up by saying, and I'm, I'm, so if you're taking notes, write this down. He said that we're gonna need to be prepared to relentlessly implement gentle verbal corrections because again, students have had few limits. He also reminded us to be really careful to not overreact. Um, and I, and I'm, I'm so fearful that this could happen. Um, I mentioned some things that might cause us alarm like a kid touch it, hugging somebody or um, not washing their hands. And, and I think we have to be careful that we don't overreact to like when a kid's gonna run out in traffic. So we need to be prepared to not overreact to misbehavior because it could serve as a trigger for students to move into that fight, flight or freeze kind of um, behavior that we see and that we've learned about in uh, trauma informed. Um, I'm gonna begin to wrap this up. So I hope that you have taken a look at those five variables that can really help your schools um, make decisions. Um, I, I found this photograph on, on the internet and, and when I've thought about it, I know that passion and your passion to be able to stop providing instruction at your school to providing virtual instruction and do it immediately was only done by your passion for what you do every day. And I also believe that same passion is gonna get us to the next stage. So um, I'm gonna stop sharing my PowerPoint. We have, believe it or not, I did leave a few minutes for questions. So I'm gonna stop sharing. I'm gonna go back in and you're probably gonna be able to see Elizabeth and Caitlin and Matt and maybe Nick. And so they may have a couple of questions for me, maybe not, I only see two in the Q and A. So were there questions or none? Sure, that, yes, there were several. I have one for you, Susan. Um, Genevieve said that if we begin our school year virtually, do you have any suggestions on building those relationships and kind of building that community? Um, after we're back from virtual or while we're virtual? If we have to start the next school year still virtually. Well, and that's going to mean that I haven't even met my teacher face to face. And so if we're going to do that, I think we're probably going to have to make some home visits. Uh, to driveways, to front porches, um, and then we're probably going to have to bring all those kids together in a Zoom meeting where we allow them to do a little bit of getting to know you um, activities. We're probably going to have to do a little, maybe everybody gets to bring something that's representative of their time at home, and uh, the first couple of meetings we get to share those so that we're actually getting to know each other. But that's going to be really difficult when I haven't met my new teacher. And my new teacher needs to be smiling and friendly from day one because mom and dad are going to be watching too. So those are so just practice, get on Zoom with it's not when it's not on and practice your first introduction to who you are. Let them see your dog, let them meet your family. Uh, I'd say, I'd say more just kind of genuine getting to know you. That's a, that's going to be a real problem. I hadn't thought about that. Yeah, and I also wanted to throw in there that um, we're really going to be doing a lot of active research into um, 
adaptations of champs for the virtual classroom. Um, what do you do at the school wide level in case we get into that. Um, but we also want to make sure that whatever we're recommending is uh, strongly grounded in research literature and um, we're gonna be meeting as teams to look at just adaptations for what we're already doing. Um, and if it does look like schools are not going to be going back, um, we, we, we are preparing to develop things to look at, look at those eventualities as we get closer. Thanks, Matt. Any other questions? I think we have time for one more, Susan, maybe. Okay. Um, this was a, a great question comment from Laura. She said that there have been pieces of distance learning that we could think of as successful like students working at their own pace and their choice of seating. And um, what are your thoughts about bringing some of these practices back to the classroom yeah, once we're together again? That, that's a very interesting question. It's very interesting because in working with um, uh, one of my colleagues in the Abilene ISD, uh, Abilene uh, uh, Independent School District, she said that was, she's a, of course a school personnel, but she's been working with her own son. And she said, here's what he's going to struggle with. He's going to struggle with having to wait until the rest of the class is, has caught up. And she said, because when I know he's got it, he's got it. And so I do think some of the benefit that we have of working independently, I think there's gonna be room to bring that into the classroom and have, you know, honestly, let's just face it, it's good differentiated learning. And it's one of those things that perhaps some of us haven't embraced as much as we could have, but now we may be able to, since we've played around with it a little bit, we may be able to begin to bring that into not every, um, every activity and not every subject matter, but certainly I think we can begin to look for uh, ways that we can, we can adapt that. All right. Um, I'm Actually, sorry. Susan, can I, um, we had a lot of questions about whether or not this uh, this webinar would be viewable later. Uh, it will be available on the Ancora Publishing YouTube link. And for all of you that registered, we will be sending out a follow-up email with that YouTube link. Great. Um, I'm just going to end it up then and just say <laughs> thank you all so much uh, for spending some time with me. I'm really sorry that um, I can't be with you. I can't, um, I can't give you hugs. Um, I, I know many of you, I've, I've said, anytime you're in Kentucky, please feel to drop, feel free to drop by my house. Uh, if I told my husband that 1,421 people were at our house, he would probably go crazy. He'd probably say there's not enough room for all of you, but I'm going to say there certainly is. And so if you get a chance, um, you're, all, you're always welcome. So I just want to, first of all, thank Matt and the folks at Encore Publishing and Safe and Civil Schools for the opportunity to, to get to at least see some of you all. So I miss you. Um, I just want to wish you good health and uh, continued safety as you continue uh, this very unusual time we're in. So thanks very much for joining me. Bye.